87 days of 3D printing. That's how long it took for our project with Neil Patrick Harris. But it wasn't sunshine and rainbows the entire way. There was a lot of process and planning and a lot of failures. And we're gonna talk about that right now. Let's see, where can we start? So in the episode, we saw the design session with Garrett and Chelsea over at Chaos Cortec. And then parts were designed, parts were printed, parts were sent to Neil, and then we went off. In this episode, I wanna talk about more uh, more about the process and the printing and the failures and what it took to actually get everything completely done and sent off to Neil. First, after the design was finalized, Chelsea sent me over some test files. She sent me these parts right here, I printed these on my Prusa Mark III at my house. This was just a test to kind of make sure the parts were printable and to kind of get a handle on things. She then sent me a couple other parts that these were gonna interface in. Those pieces that I showed you had to interface with pieces such as this and this right here. The idea was to get these printed and then they could interface like this and then the parts could go on top. Before we interface the parts though, I do have to tell you, there were failures, massive, massive failures. These belt printers behind me, I had all sorts of bed adhesion issues. I used uh, a certain file from Carl over at NAC 3D, which essentially looked like sheets of paper. I tried 3D Gloop, I tried nanopolymer adhesive, I tried Magic Goo, I tried all the things and what ended up working out was this Aquanet hairspray. I just spritzed some on the bed as it was starting and we started to get some prints. Let's see if those parts fit. If you're looking at this, this part goes here and this part goes here. There we go. This was proof that the parts were going to work out and it meant that what Chelsea needed to do next was get everything laid out. All of the parts were gonna be sent my way for 3D printing. Now that we had all the pieces, what we had to do is set up a specific room to do all this. And that's this room right here. I called this Print Central or something like that. I've got CR30s on the wall here. I've got my Kickstarter CR30 there. I've got a Prusa Mark III and a Prusa Mini. Over here at the time, I had switched out a CR6 SE, a Neptune, an FL Sun, a Super Racer. I had an Anycubic Viper. Uh, I had lots of machines in here at the time, but this was the room where all of the prints were done. I don't know if you can see all these stacks right here, but that's all uh, filament from Dave over at Printed Solid. Fine, I'll go get more. That's Design White, Jesse PLA. And Dave said he designed that filament and calls it Design White because it's meant to be sanded and painted, which I thought was great because that's what this project was. And what I did in here is feed all of the filaments through my rep box. Right there, it's a Prusa rep box. It seemed only really appropriate that the Prusa rep box fed the Prusas, but that is what held all of the normal size spools. And then the big spools, one would go on the G-Max right here, and the other, the big spools actually fit right here. Just like that. And this other one from SNR Tech Bytes, that also held a big spool. With the room staged and set, it meant that we were ready to print. Now what we had to do was slice all of the files that Chelsea sent us. And wow, as I went through and sliced all these, I got times for printing per part and then multiplied that by the number of parts I needed. As an example, here's this piece right here. This is called, let's see, deco slide, deco side under bar one and each one of these took seven hours to print. There were 12 in total, which meant 84 hours of 3D printing just for this piece. This is deco side number two. And because I was printing three frames, I needed 36 of these. Each one of these was nine hours to print, and that meant 342 hours of 3D printing for this piece. This is deco corner inner. I needed 12 of these in total, four per frame. Uh, each one was three hours to print, and so 36 hours in total for this piece right here. This one, the Deco Center Large, it's huge. Each one of these was 15 hours to print, and four per frame meant I need 12 of those, and that came out to 180 hours of 3D printing just for this one. So I have to step back for these. These, uh, these are frame long, frame long? <laughs> the, the one and two, 
one and two. They are probably five feet tall. And I needed six of these, two per frame. I have to look over here. It was 144 hours for each one of these, which, which means 864, 864 hours in total, which translates to 36 days of 3D printing just for six of these. And so uh, finally, we've got frame short one and two. Frame short one and two. That's these right here. These took, I have to look again, 96 hours each. And I needed six of these, two per frame, which gives us a grand total of 576 hours of 3D printing for this, which is 24 days. 24 days for six of these parts. What? All of these parts, all of them, took an amazing amount of time through all of these various 3D printers. What we ended up with is 2,190 hours of 3D printing, which translates to 91 days, six hours. It's kind of funny because in the video, I said it was 87 days of 3D printing. I had forgotten to count one of the short frames. So in essence, it was more than 91 days of 3D printing. That's three months of 24 seven 3D printing. I know I mentioned uh, failures on the CR30s before. So these ones right here on the wall, bed adhesion was an issue. And it wasn't until I got that Aquanet that I started getting consistent prints. I would, I would take this Aquanet and just kind of spray the area where the print was gonna start. And that would seem to work and hold it. Uh, just the continual printing on that belt seemed to give it more of, uh, more adhesion. That seems to be kind of what others had been seeing. Right now they're kind of doing other projects. This one is doing, well, something. Uh, this one is broken. So it just keeps rebooting itself. These CR30s are some of the coolest machines and some of the most frustrating machines I've ever dealt with. I did happen to have an issue with the CR6 SE and I only got a couple parts out of it. But I, I mean, I got a few good ones, but the issue was I couldn't get anything to stick to this bed were the beans, nothing, nothing would stick. A lot of the times, any of the really small, intricate things that had to be laid down as a first layer just weren't working. I mean, I could slow it down, I could add a bed adhesion helper, but even then it wasn't consistent. And so the CR6 produced some of the parts, not that many though, and it had to be pulled from the rotation in order to make room for a machine that would actually work. This here, that's the FL Sun Super Racer, and I did use it for some of the parts, but the hot end, it just kept jamming on me, and I, I don't know why. I don't think I was pushing it too fast. I haven't had the time to investigate that yet, but I did get a couple parts off of this, but for the most part, I was getting jams, and it had to be pulled from rotation. I gotta give credit where credit's due, and I gotta tell you, the Prusa Mini and the Prusa Mark III, seen here, performed flawlessly, like automatic. It was just print after print after print after print. A little bit of IPA on the bed between each and it was good to go. Hundreds and hundreds of hours on just these two machines right here. They just, they just worked. And uh, I'm not being paid to say that. I'm just telling you in this project with thousands of hours of 3D printing, these worked well. You know, while we're talking about good things, let's also talk about this Anycubic Viper. This thing is fantastic. The automatic bed leveling on this just worked. It just worked every single time. And I was able to get tons and tons of prints off this thing. And with this Anycubic powder coated PEI-esque sort of sheet that's on there, I didn't even have to put IPA on it in between each print. Each print just popped right off and I hit go again and hundreds of hours just on this machine alone. Any cubic, good job on the Viper. One of the other things that kept me up at night was the constant monitoring I did. You can see on each of these machines, I've got a Wise cam that, uh, that just is on and I can record the time lapses, which you did see in the video, but I can also just log in on my phone day or night and just kind of track the print. And they came in super duper handy. There were times at one o'clock in the morning where I'd have to put on my pants and come to the office and fix something. And it was because I was monitoring with, with these cameras. This was the floor that I got everything done. So the next steps, once everything was printed, 
was to organize the parts and make sure I had enough for the two frames to send to Neil. I used this floor, it was clearer back then, to stage the parts and then I snapped a couple photos so I could send them ahead just to give Neil and crew an idea of what was coming their way. From there, everything was boxed up into some rather large packages and taken to UPS. I, uh, I actually had a super friendly UPS person help me out and then they repackaged them into two packages that were properly, um, proper. <laughs> they had foam, foam and packing materials and properly uh, prepared for the journey ahead of them. And the goal was to get these over as fast as I could. And so I got these to UPS about 2.30 my time on a day. And then I was told the UPS truck would pick them up at 4 p.m. my time, 4, 4 p.m. Pacific. And they ended up getting to Neil's doorstep. UPS actually putting the packages on Neil's doorstep at 9.55 a.m. the next day, Eastern Standard or Eastern Daylight Time. So it took very little time to get from Seattle, Washington to East Hampton, New York. And it was just amazing to witness. I gotta tell you, this was quite the adventure because then what we had to do was get on an airplane and fly to New York, rent a car, and then drive to East Hampton. It was an easy trip, it was a red-eye trip, and then once we got to the house, Neil was still at work doing some stuff and he was going to arrive a little bit later. Uh, we got a little bit of a tour of the house from, the, from Taylor there at the house and then <laughs> I took a nap. <laughs> I took a nap. I was tired. And then Neil showed up. We went to dinner. The next day was a shooting day, so we got a bunch of stuff filmed. The frames were revealed. Oh my gosh, they turned out so good. Neil gave us a bit of a tour of the house. We got to see all these different thematic rooms. It's, it's crazy to see. Everything looked so amazing, and I, I really hope I get the chance to go back. Neil was a very gracious and kind host. Uh, everyone at the house, their friend, I think it was Mike and Taylor at the house, wonderful people. Oh my gosh, it was just, it was an incredible experience to remember. The next day we wrapped up filming with a little bit and then we took off to the airport and then flew home. I'm so thankful this happened and I'm so thankful I was able to get a video out for you all to see. Well, I, <laughs> I've got some other work to get to. Hope you enjoyed this little vlog about the experience. Uh, if you made this far, you're awesome. Don't forget to hug each other more and as always, High five.